Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette. Today's video is all about the big horn on my forehead. Yes, I'm 36 and sometimes I still have to deal with that stuff. On a more serious note, this video is all about expensive items that are worth their money. Because if you're a big spender, you to make sure you do so wisely. And by the way, this video is 100% not sponsored. So we haven't received any money or products from that. This is all just based on experiences of things that we bought with our own money. If you're a regular here, you remember that in 2017, we did a video like this before, and you can watch the first one here. Generally, we don't put much stock in just expensive items because they're just about status. At the Gentleman's Gazette, we're all about quality. In order to get a good quality product, sometimes you have to spend more money than what you would feel comfortable spending. I like to think of my purchases as investments, even though back in my head, I know that's really the case in the original sense of the word. So without further ado, the first expensive item worth its money is a pair of bespoke shoes. If you're watching this video right now on this channel, chances are you've already invested in a quality pair of men's dress shoes. In the beginning, spending $300 on a pair of shoes may seem like a lot. And to make sure you get the best bang for your buck, check out this video here. Once you've climbed that mountain, you start wondering, well, what more will I get if I spend $500, $600, $700, or $800? And then you invest in more brands. Maybe you buy shoes from Crocodile Jones. Maybe you buy something from Edward Green or a brand like Carmina. Or if you don't like the English style, maybe you go with something from Stefano Bamer or something more Hungarian looking, like a Heinrich Dinklacker boot. Maybe you've even acquired a made-to-order shoe that cost north of $1,000. At that point, you get a high level of craftsmanship, you get exactly the look that you want, and if you don't have problem feet, that's great. However, as a close horse, you will certainly enjoy the experience of working with a craftsman, designing the shoe, looking at the design, getting inspirations from pictures and videos, and coming up with something that is truly unique to you. Not only will the fit be superior, especially if a loafer shoe, but you can also choose the leather, the waist treatment, and little details like the shape of the brooding. On top of that, you become a supporter of the crafts, and that is awesome. How much does it cost? Well, it depends. It's probably hard to find bespoke or custom shoes under $1,000, and you have to make compromises. Under $2,000, you can find maybe very few, if you go above that, you can spend all the way up to $10,000 or more dollars if you choose to go with really expensive alligator skins, for example. The second expensive item worth investing in is a camel hair polo coat. A polo coat made of camel hair typically has a very unique style. Typically, it has peak lapels, patch pockets with flaps, a half belt in the back, a seam on the sleeve, cuffs, and a single center vent. It also has this natural, camel hair colored, caramel, beigey look that really stands out from the gray, black, and navy overcoats. And it works extremely well with any kind of brown tone. There was a time when Ralph Lauren was pretty much the only one where you could find a coat like that. Today, there's many other places where you can pick up one of those coats. Or of course, you can have it made bespoke. That being said, many of them are not actually made of real camel hair, but of other wool. So why should you go with camel hair versus wool? Well, camel hair is a different material. It's rather soft, but also extremely warm, and it has a different texture than a wool fabric has generally. It also ages differently than wool, especially on the edges of the sleeves, for example. You can pick one up from Ralph Lauren for about 2,500 bucks. O'Connell's has one for $1,500, and for 10% more, you get one at Ben Silver. To learn more about overcoats and how you go about buying one, check out our in-depth guide on our channel. The third expensive thing we think is worth it is Green Irish Tweed from Creed. It's really hard to pick a cologne that works for all gentlemen because it's a personal thing. That being said, Green Irish Tweed from Creed really comes close to it, and everyone in our office liked it. On the one hand, it's a woody and earthly scent. On the other hand, it's quite bright. In the past, we've called it a classic fragrance. And we also found that it's worth it. 
and you can learn why and more about the nuances and the smelling profile and the bass notes in our other video here. In my book, it's more of a fall winter scent, but I could definitely see it also being worn in the summer. I find it appropriate for the office, for evening occasions, or for social occasions. And on my skin, it lasts about six to eight hours, which I think is pretty good. Sometimes my wife even comes the next day and she can still smell that I put on Green Energy Street the night before. It's a classic and mature scent that starts at an expensive $300 for just 50 milliliters. Of course, it's at the retail price and you may be able to find it for less, but be aware of fake scents out there. The fourth expensive item worth investing in is a high quality cashmere scarf that has the right length and size for a gentleman to be worn with his clothes. I know you can find pashmina or cashmere scarves at street vendors in New York for $5, but obviously that's not what I'm talking about here. A quality cashmere scarf has long staples that are rather thin, which makes it very soft on your skin, but it also doesn't peel right away like cheaper cashmere would. At Fort Belvedere, we source our cashmere mostly from Mongolia, and Preston personally went over there and inspected every single goat. No, just kidding. Each hair is between 14 and six and a half microns thick and about 35 to 50 millimeter long. That's about one and a half to two inches. To learn more about the differences in cashmere and the different quality levels, please check out our in-depth guide here. Of course, the color or pattern you get is up to you. I found that subtle classic patterns like a herringbone or a hound's tooth are great. Also, solid scarves work well, especially if lots of patterned overcoats. Currently, my favorite cashmere scarves are probably some burnt orange ones or mustard yellow ones mixed with gray. They go well with a navy overcoat, which is black, gray, or brown. And they're different, but not too vibrant. We also paid great attention to the right width and length, so it covers my entire V-neck. It keeps my neck warm without being bulky. A Fort Belvedere scarf retails for $195, but you can also spend a lot more for a scarf from Hermes or Burberry, for example. And we did an Is It Worth It video about it here. Naturally, there are also many other companies which make high quality cashmere scarves. But keep in mind, once you go considerably under $200, you probably compromise somewhere when it comes to quality. Of course, the scarf is just one part of the outfit. If you want to learn how to combine your scarf with your overcoat and your gloves, this video might be for you. The fifth item worth investing in is a high quality office chair. Most gentlemen who work in an office environment spend a considerable time sitting over the course of a day. A low quality desk chair won't just feel cheap and be uncomfortable to sit in, but it also doesn't provide you the support you need and it will hurt your body in the long term. The problem with some designer chairs is that they're all sizzle and no steak. You get a cool shape, you get bold colors and certain gimmicks, but ultimately it's not ergonomically designed and not good for you. In our office, we trust a brand that has been synonymous with high quality office furniture for decades, and that's Herman Miller. Personally, I've been using their Aaron chair ever since I started getting a lower back pain from sitting on a bad chair. It comes in three different sizes based on your height and weight. You can make all the adjustments that you need it's comfortable and it has an iconic design. I really like the adjustable lumbar support and the mesh fabric that keeps your body temperature at a comfortable level versus with other chairs I regularly overheat. Overall, I can adjust it in 10 different ways and it retails for around $1,400 when it's all decked out. I know it's not cheap, but your back will thank you for it. You also get a 12 year warranty, which is pretty impressive and it covers parts and labor. If you want to spend a little less, maybe you find a used chair, you're still in pretty good shape typically, or you can go with the Mira 2, which we also have in our office, we're very happy with. The sixth item worth its cost is a high quality leather Chesterfield couch. Frankly, in your home, one of the easiest way to get that classic gentleman look is to add a leather Chesterfield sofa. If you're interested in classic interiors, you may like this video, and we also have covered sofas before. Now, not all Chesterfields are alike, but how can you distinguish quality from crap? First of all, quality Chesterfield sofas are built on a solid wood frame, particularly a solid hardwood that is kiln dried, 
meaning the moisture has been basically sucked out because it was dried at higher temperatures. And that means the frame won't twist over time and make your furniture look awkward or uneven. Typically, solid maple or beech wood is used, but any type of hardwood will do. Now, buyer beware. I noticed many companies saying they have hardwood frames or kiln-dried hardwood frames, but when you look at it, it's actually kiln-dried hardwood made into plywood. That's not what you want. You want the real hardwood. Next up, the best Chesterfields have a really deep tufting. Lots of cheaper ones have very shallow tufting. And that's one of the best ways how you can spot a quality one from an inferior one. When it comes to sitting on a piece of furniture, comfort is king, of course. And the higher end manufacturers offer a larger variety of different foams and different comfort levels because different letters have different stiffnesses. And so they need to be combined with different foams to get that perfect feeling when you sit down on it. In order to sit comfortably for a long time, you want to use the traditional way of using metal coils underneath the foam that are hand tied in eight different spots. Now, you want each coil to be individually hand tied from the furniture maker and not get a hand tie coil pad that is pre-made and just ships in from China. Also note that many inexpensive Chesterfields come only with a tufted bag and tufted sides, but with individual non-tufted seat cushions. Well, tufting is expensive and just using individual cushions is just a lot more price aggressive. Personally, I find a tufted seat bench to be a lot more attractive. In my book, the tufted seat should be comfortable and soft. Sometimes they're built into a couch and there's not enough foam and you can't specify how soft you want it. And that's not something that I would enjoy or buy. Another very important aspect of the Chesterfield is of course the leather. Yes, you can go with fabric, but for the classic gentleman look, I find leather to be your best choice. That being said, a top grain, aniline dyed, hand stained leather that is waxed with an open pore is my first choice. Now that kind of leather is a lot more expensive because it's uncorrected, it's not sanded, it's not bonded leather. Now a high end, super soft and supple top grain leather that is completely unprotected will not last longer than a lower grade leather with a protective finish, but it feels a lot better. And when I sit in it, I really enjoy that. If you get an unprotected leather, just make sure you don't expose it to sunlight because it will fade a lot more quickly than something that's protected, for example. Also, if you have kids, pets, or you eat on your sofa, maybe get something that works with your lifestyle. I've looked at many Chesterfield companies. In the US, I find that Hancock & Moore provide a superior product. That's what I personally have right now in my house, and that's also what I order again. The one we have right now is close to 20 years old and it's still in great shape. It sits comfortably and it's just a fantastic Chesterfield looking sofa. They're expensive. Their retail price is typically anywhere between 14 and $25,000. Now, in that industry, getting 50% off, even at your regular dealer, is normal. So the real street price is more between seven and 12,000, depending on the grade of letter you choose. Now, Hancock and Moore really selects their hides so they all match on the entire couch. Sometimes with other companies, you may get uh, couches that have different colors because the leather came from different dye lots. And that's not something I personally like. The seventh thing worth your money is a quality chef's knife. Even though cooking was historically not a classic gentlemanly pursuit, the modern gentleman often embraces it. And of course, as a home chef, you require quality tools. If there was just one knife I had, it would be the chef's knife. Originally, it was designed to slice things and to disjoint meats, but now it has become this universal kitchen tool. No matter if you cut beef, if you slice carrots or minced garlic, it will do the job. I've tried chef knives from many different companies, and basically my two favorites are Japanese blades and German blades. Typically, Japanese knives are made out of a thinner layered steel that is sharpened at an angle of around 16 degrees. The steel is often harder, which means it takes longer for the blade to get dull, but it's also more tricky and harder to sharpen it. 
That's why I have my knife sharpened by professional. It's ideal for precision cutting, and while the steel is harder and keeps the edge longer, it's also not stainless and you have to take care of your knife. Meaning, just keep it dry and don't wash it and just let it sit there so rust can form. Generally, I like the lightweight and the responsiveness of Japanese knives. They're just a joy to work with. On the other hand, German knives are generally a little thicker, they also have a great knife making tradition, and they're sharpened at a 20 degree angle. They're typically made from a softer steel, which means you have to sharpen it more often, but it's less likely to chip when you maybe drop it. I find it more suitable for heavy duty work and work with bones because I don't have to be afraid of knife chips, which is a concern when I use the Japanese knives. Personally, I also prefer the German boning knives over the Japanese one because they're really nice and flexible, but not too flexible. They get the job done with minimal waste. What do you recommend? Maybe a Schoen Premier 8 inch chef's knife retails for $225. Or you get something German like from Wüsthof for about $165. And then there's my favorite boning knife. It's from Zwilling J.A. Henkels. I think it's $110 and it's fantastic. Some people like to have the same look in their knife block. I rather have the best tool for each job, so I use different knives from different brands based on what I like. The eighth item worth its money, not just for gentlemen, is a Vitamix blender. You can make salsa, dips, vinaigrettes, or other types of sauces. It's good for drinks like daiquiris or smoothies. It's also great for purees and particularly soups. Why? Well, you get a super creamy texture without adding any actual cream or other fats. You can even make homemade flours and nut butters and much more. There are a few different models, but they're all very similar. Some have some pre-programmed settings, others don't, but they're all very powerful and you can find those large 64 ounce canisters. Best of all, when I'm done with it, I just add water and dish soap, put in a lid and let it run, and then I just pour it out and it's clean. It comes with a seven year warranty and supposedly they only have two people employed in the warranty department, which says a lot about that kind of a product and the quality. It feels very rugged and built to last, but it also should be because it costs almost $600 and a substitute canister costs $100, which seems ridiculous because it's mostly plastic with a few metal parts, but at the end of the day, they know they have a quality product that does what it should and they price it for the value of the consumer. The ninth expensive adding worth its money is a Rolex stainless steel sports watch. In our first video of this nature in 2017, we missed a expensive watch. In our book, a gentleman's wristwatch is a highly personal thing. It depends on your personal style, your lifestyle, your surroundings, your job, and how you want to be perceived. Personally, I made a video about why I'm not attracted to Rolex watches in general. That being said, for many men, Rolex is a great buy, if not the best buy when it comes to sports watches. And I explain in this video why that is the case. In a nutshell, Rolex produces consistently popular watches with a wide appeal that come with a social cachet. If you buy the right watch, in this video I tell you which ones those are, you can bet that it will increase in value over time and you can buy a watch today at retail price and sell it probably 10 years down the line for the same price or more. At the time of filming this video, a stainless steel Rolex Datejust costs about $8,000. You can also find the Rolex Cellini line, which is more a traditional dress watch that is really expensive at retail of $20,000 or more, but you can find them relatively inexpensively on the used market, for example. So the Cellini is not a Rolex watch that I would consider to be an investment watch. Now, if Rolex is not your thing, check out this video about the JLC Reverso, which may be more of interest to you. I know in the comments people say, well, what about the Patek Philippe Calatrava? What about the Nautilus? And so forth. Yes, the Holy Trinity makes great watches. There are plenty of good watch channels out there on YouTube. We're not one of them. But if you want to learn how to pronounce watch brand names correctly, check out this video here. The tenth thing worth investing in is a nice selection of evening bow ties. At the time of filming this video, many people around the world are still in lockdown, and the idea of a black tie or white tie evening may seem enticing, but it seems too far away to really enjoy it. 
Well, at the Gentleman's Gazette, we always look at things long term. And so we know that once all of this is over, we'll have time to enjoy formal dinner parties again. Most men will be able to get away with a single black bow tie that they can wear over and over again. But as a close horse, it's really nice to change the look of your tuxedo based on the material you use, whether it's velvet or satin silk or a grosgrain white rib. But of course, you can also change the shape. A big butterfly, a small bat wing, maybe a diamond shape. There's just lots of nuance in an ensemble that is typically dominated by rules and dress codes. It's just an opportunity for you to shine on a personal level. Now, a quality men's black tie will always be sized to exactly your neck size. There won't be any adjusters. And it can be single-ended or it can be double-ended. To learn more about which bow tie is right for your face shape, please check out our video. Now, what's the difference between spending over $100 on a Fort Belvedere evening bow tie and something you can maybe find on Amazon for under $20? Again, it's the quality. The luster you get from our silk, the feel and the stiffness is just way superior to the stuff you get for under $20. Also, the ability to match it to the lapel of your tuxedo is really nice. You also don't have any clunky straps, so you can wear it with wing collars. And it's just really not at the end of the day to be able to untie the bow tie. And being able to tie it yourself gives you the opportunity to add a personal note to your black tie outfit. And of course, we have different videos for beginners and for advanced people on how to tie a bow tie. Last but not least, let's close out with something that is relatively expensive, but that even people on a budget can afford. And that's a red sweet vermouth from Carpano Antica Formula. It's a vermouth that has a stronger character profile and a kick of vanilla. There's a citrusy, clovey note and a rich, sweet body that will really upgrade any cocktail that uses red or sweet vermouth. The combined flavors create somewhat of a unique tasting sensation that is appreciated by most people. Why is it so good and worth its money? Again, it's about the quality. It starts with the ingredients. They use white wine grapes from the Puglia region of Sicily. They also use high quality vanilla beans from Madagascar, New Guinea, or Tahiti. The production is centuries old, and so they really understand how to extract the botanicals for the best flavor appeal. It upgrades any Negroni, Americano, or Manhattan, whatever else you drink. A one in the bottle retails for $35 in the US, but for most people, a smaller 375 milliliter bottle for $17.50 will be money well spent, even though the per unit cost is higher. If you don't use vermouth, it may go off and you just have to pour it all out. Now, while we're at the subject of making drinks, another quality item are maraschino cherries from Luxardo. They cost about 20 bucks for a small 400 gram jar, but these are sour cherries that are nicely sweet. You can even use a syrup sometimes in cocktails for decorative or flavor purposes. And they're just so much better than the typical red cherry that you get. They don't have a pit, they don't have a stem, and they're just what you find in high quality cocktails and bars across the globe. Of course, you can also use them for desserts or in your ice cream, but for cocktails, they're just second to none. Now, what are some expensive items that you think are worth their money? Please share with us in the comments below. In today's video, I'm wearing a blazer outfit. The jacket is from Isaiah, and I think I may exchange the buttons for some mother of pearl buttons. The shirt I'm wearing today was the first quality shirt I bought in 2003 at a secondhand store. It was new then, but um, it opened up my eyes to quality shirting. It's blue and white striped, works well with a blazer. I'm combining it with a chartreuse green knit tie from Fort Belvedere, which you can find in our shop here. It's paired with a blue and white pocket square with cross stitches along the edges, all hand rolled likewise from Fort Belvedere, and it picks up the colors of the shirt. The pants are an interesting greenish color that pick up the chartreuse tone with a light blue window pane. They were made for me by Tom James years ago. I like that the blue works well with my star sapphire ring, which is white gold, and that harmonizes well with my 
platinum-plated cufflinks, which are monkey fist knots from Fort Belvedere, which you can also find in our shop here, just like these shadow stripe socks. The brown and beige works well with the pants, as well as with the shoes, and it just ties it all together. My feet, I'm wearing a pair of single monk straps from Alton in Paris, which have a handmade custom patina, which was made on a crust leather. <laughs> Thank you.